Good morning, everyone. Ready to go? Ready to go. All right. Good morning. My name is Gretchen Musicant, and I'm a member. Oh, let's see. If I'm at the microphone, I can take off my big red blob here. Good morning. Um, my name is Gretchen Musicant, and I'm a member of Westminster Social Justice Ministry Team. We build our social justice forums around a common theme, and this program year, our theme is Diving Deeper Together So We Will Flourish. This theme builds on our heightened awareness of the systemic and critical issues affecting our community, brought to greater attention in recent years, most especially in response to the murder of George Floyd. Through the forums, we will learn about long-standing needs and become more prepared to support the flourishing of all members of our community. Today, we welcome David Hottinger, addressing the impacts of trauma and adopting a trauma-informed lens. David Hottinger leads the spiritual care team at Hennepin Healthcare, where he also co-leads a system-wide effort to become trauma-informed system of care. A native of Ohio, he received his bachelor's at Oberlin College and master's of divinity from the Harvard Divinity School. He was a Wahlberg fellow at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and worked with Palestinian refugees in the West Bank and Gaza for 18 months. David has served in hospital, mental health, and hospice settings as a chaplain. I'm just going to talk a little bit about logistics here in terms of questions and answers because we'll have an opportunity for that in today's forum. For those attending in person here in the Mizell room, raise your hand and we'll have a microphone and we'll bring it over to you and include those in the live stream so they can hear your questions and comments. For those attending on live stream, please submit your comments or questions in the live stream chat. And Jo Beld is here, and she will be monitoring that and raise your questions or comments on your behalf. With that, I'm going to turn it over to David. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Thank you, uh, Gretchen. Uh, it's wonderful to be with you here this morning. I'd like to open with a blessing that was written by the pastor and theologian and poet uh, Jan Richardson. And this is entitled, Blessing in a Time of Violence, which is to say this blessing is always, which is to say there is no place this blessing does not long to cry out and lament, to weep its words in sorrow, to scream its lines in sacred rage, which is to say there is no day this blessing ceases to whisper into the ear of the dying, the despairing, the terrified, which is to say there is no moment this blessing refuses to sing itself into the heart of the hated and the hateful, the victim and the victimizer, with every last ounce of hope it has, which is to say there is none that can stop it, none that can halt its course, none that will still its cadence, none that will delay its rising, none that can keep it from springing forth. From the mouths of us who hope, from the hands of us who act, from the hearts of us who love, from the feet of us who will not cease our stubborn, aching, marching, marching. Until this blessing has spoken its final word, until this blessing has breathed its benediction in every place, in every tongue. Peace, peace, peace. And that's from her uh, collection of blessings, The Cure for Sorrow, Jan Richardson. I'm gonna start my, uh, since there's no preacher's clock back there, um, I need to uh, start my uh, alarm to make sure I keep time. All right, well, thank you again for the invitation. It's wonderful to be with you at Westminster. I live in the neighborhood. I felt very welcomed here in my years uh, living near Loring Park. Um, most especially uh, grateful um, that uh, you have shared with us uh, Chad Quaintance, um, who has been volunteering in our spiritual care department for a number of years and has become uh, 
really an essential member of our team as uh, we try to care for patients and families and community at Hennepin Healthcare. So it's a real blessing to be with uh, Chad this morning uh, in, in his home turf here at Westminster. Um, I am ordained in the United Church of Christ and a member of Mayflower uh, UCC, but have always felt very welcome here at Westminster. So thank you for having me this morning. My task is a big, a big one. Um, it is to give an overview of trauma-informed care. And my lens is going to be from a healthcare and spiritual care perspective, but I think has a lot for all of us uh, in the faith community, especially as we grapple with uh, the issue that you're talking about uh, for this forum, uh, race and uh, racism. A little bit more about my context, you probably know uh, if you're in downtown, about Hennepin Healthcare, we're a level one trauma center for both uh, adults and children. Uh, we teach a lot of physicians, a lot of nurses. We're actually beginning to teach chaplains for the first time since 2002, um, beginning this week. We've got some uh, clinical pastoral education students with us for a year. Very important for this context, we're a safety net hospital. So on a given day, about 70% of our patients um, are there through medical assistance or through the Medicaid program. So they are people who often uh, are, are, are poor, come from vulnerable communities, and we're very proud of that, that mission of being a safety net hospital. And we are beginning a very long journey to become a trauma-informed health system. So right off the bat, what's trauma-informed care? And here's just one definition. There are many out there. Uh, it's a strength-based framework that's grounded in an understanding of and responsiveness to the impact of trauma, it emphasizes physical, psychological, and emotional safety for both providers and survivors, and creates opportunities for survivors to rebuild a sense of control and empowerment. You'll be hearing a lot of those themes repeated this morning. A little bit more about my context and, and my journey to learn about trauma-informed care, especially as a chaplain. Um, Hennepin is a very busy place um, in terms of uh, hospitals in the upper Midwest. We're probably the busiest emergency department between Denver and Chicago. Um, you can see all those statistics. The average daily sense is 333. I was thinking, wow, that's very low compared to for the last six, eight weeks, we've been up 440, 430, 450. Um, as all these hospitals experience surge situations. I was sharing with Gretchen this morning, we made a decision uh, just Friday to cap our census at 415, which is just because we are so overwhelmed, we're understaffed, and um, we, we just can't take care of patients safely right now with what's happening. So it's, it's, it's a very um, stress-inducing time for healthcare systems and obviously people who, who come and get care in them. Uh, <clears throat> that bottom statistic, which is not something hospitals offer, this is not off the website, because hospitals don't really like to talk about the fact that people die in them, but we do, we do. that's where most of us uh, end up dying, Americans, um, is in the hospital setting. We had 740 deaths this past year, which was up 22% from, from the year before, and some of those were COVID. Um, this year, though, we're on track to have almost as many deaths, which is about you know, two people a day, and it's not COVID deaths primarily, it's other sorts of things. So we had the busiest trauma season uh, after the murder of George Floyd uh, that we've had in our history. And so, we, you know, you, you read the newspaper, we know there has been such a trauma response in the community, um, lots of not just violence, but also um, overdoses, suicides, all kinds of accidents happening, and, and that has remained the case. So it's, it's a very um, chaotic time to work in a, in a healthcare system and, and be in the community. My entree to learning about trauma-informed care was a rather slow one. Um, this slide actually was from 2014, and some of you remember uh, there was a, a drive-by shooting right outside our emergency department in the middle of the day. Um, miraculously, no one was wounded. There was just a spray of bullets. Um, and uh, it was an extremely terrifying event for staff and for people who were around the hospital, people who live in downtown. Fast forward to 2016, uh, the, the summer of, and many of you will recognize this picture, and I have 
his family's permission to talk a little bit about uh, Philando Castile. Um, I was the, the chaplain on call the evening that uh, Philando Castile was, was fatally shot um, uh, by a, a suburban police officer over in uh, Falcon Heights. Uh, he was brought to our hospital just because um, the, the paramedics thought it would be a faster route to HCMC than it would to, to regions from, from where Flando was, was shot. And um, things did not go well that night. Obviously, his family was in deep grief. It was a horrifying situation. But in large part because of what had happened a couple years before, um, our hospital was kind of stuck in a pretty profound trauma response. And we'll talk about what that kind of looks like when people have trauma. Um, we had sort of gone into this um, lockdown mentality, uh, saw every victim of violence in exactly the same way, saw everything as a threat, and um, that led us to, uh, to behave actually in some atrocious ways uh, toward Philando's family that night, and I, I was part of some of that. Um, Blessedly, uh, his family and some leaders in the community, you know, had had the presence of mind and the courage to to come to our leaders and say that's not okay. You know, what what happened to us uh, inflicted uh, further harm after we experienced this horrific loss, um, and we need you to do better. So these are some more of the headlines from 2016. Then uh, you remember from a few years ago, it's never good when you make the New York Times with a headline like this. Uh, when we were under scrutiny for uh, the use of ketamine, which is a very uh, powerful sedative by our, our, by our EMS, um, and uh, reports that Minneapolis police were ordering our paramedics to actually subdue people with ketamine who they were trying to arrest, and this was investigated. Yet a further kind of thing to erode trust from our community uh, toward us. Um, and then you add into the mix the what we all know now, and hopefully are paying a lot more attention to after the murder of George Floyd, that you know, Minnesota uh, is one of the uh, bottom states in the United States for racial disparities, um, particularly when it comes to health care. And so uh, on a given day, I shared how many of our patients and families um, are, are on medical assistance. About 60% of our patients on a given day are, are people of color, indigenous people. And so that, uh, in, in you, you look at racial disparities and histories of, of racism and trauma in communities, and the, the, what people then are bringing to them when they come for, for care, that comes into the mix for what our healthcare system has to address. So it's a toxic mix. Uh, understandable mistrust of healthcare systems by people of color because of our abysmal history um, as systems. High rates of burnout, toxic stress and trauma exposure among healthcare workers. I put this slide together a couple years ago. Well, it's off the charts worse now since you know, the, the pandemic uh, and then also the, uh, the, the state of, of, of racial tension and disparities uh, being highlighted. Uh, as I mentioned, Minnesota's uh, abysmal state of disparities, uh, this sense of siege and threat within healthcare institutions, and that's a trauma response. Uh, we see then more patients coming in. They're already, it seems, very on edge when they arrive um, because of the, the mistrust, because of the exposure to trauma in the community. So we've seen more behavior escalations, more violence inside the hospitals, more instances of verbal abuse. And then institutions do what they typically know how to do. It doesn't work, but they try to impose more order. You know, law and order is the answer. Let's try to control the chaos. Let's put down more rules and regulations and protocols and procedures that will keep people in, con you know, in control, make them behave. Does that work too? No, that hasn't worked very well. Uh, and then this just leads to a cycle, a vicious cycle then of more escalation, more complaints, uh, more lack of engagement uh, from our staff. My own personal journey, uh, as I began to learn about trauma-informed care, 
there's really a sense of powerlessness about caring for patients and families who have had much deeper emotional, cultural, and spiritual wounds than my training prepared me to address. I mean, I had a pretty good education. You know, um, I had a, I had, I was trained well as a chaplain. But that training did not begin to, to scratch the surface of, of what I needed to do in a place like Hennepin Healthcare. There was the intersection of my own life trauma with work with trauma victims. The, that year and a half I spent in Israel, Palestine was during a very tumultuous time. Um, a lot of the, 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 the uh, exposure I had to violence there kind of just went underground and then uh, resurfaced when I began working as a staff chaplain with all these situations of, of violence and, and chaos and realized I had some healing to do uh, for myself. I was frustrated with the individualistic psychological and spiritual care models I had learned because these failed to address the systemic effects of chronic and historical trauma and racism. You know, I was trained primarily in the 80s and 90s. Things were very individualistic focused and I did not have the tools and resources I needed to understand uh, how to provide spiritual care in this context. I began to recognize that whole care systems can become organized around trauma. We'll talk about that in just a few minutes, see what that means. Whole systems can become fundamentally, even unconsciously, organized around the impact of, cr of chronic stress and toxic stress. Well, after the, 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 the murder of Philando and, and what happened with his family, um, because our spiritual care team had been a very loud voice for advocacy within our system, um, you know, be careful what you hope for. Then the leadership came and said, okay, so help us fix this. I'm like, oh, well, I don't think it's just up to the chaplains to fix the problem that we, we have here. But we were able to partner with, with some other leaders in the organization to co-lead an improvement initiative to change policies and procedures and protocols around the ways victims of violence and their loved ones are welcomed when they arrive. And important to me in my journey was encountering this work of Sandra Bloom. She's a um, psychiatrist out in Philadelphia, has written a lot of books and papers, but um, she really helped me understand uh, trauma-informed care from a, a very deep way, the neurobiology of st stress and trauma, what it does to our brains and our bodies, and then how whole organizations can become um, organized around trauma and impacted by it. So a couple of um, definitions here. One is traumatic stress. Uh, and again, this is kind of an individualistic, but don't think just about person. Think about families. Think about community. Think about an organization, a church, a neighborhood. When you experience an event that's overwhelming, it's usually life-threatening, not always. It's terrifying or horrifying in the face of helplessness. So it, it's not the, the event itself that constitutes trauma, it's our response to it. So what, one, what can impact one person, and you seem like they sort of went through something horrible and seemed just fine, could have a very different impact on somebody else. Toxic stress. That's associated with a prolonged and intense activation of the body's stress response to such an extent can change the way a child's brain develops, the very architecture of the brain with problematic long-term consequences. So we'll talk about this in a minute. When children are exposed over and over again to, uh, to abuse, to um, violence in the home, uh, to, in the neighborhood, in the community, uh, this can have long-term effects on our brains and on our bodies. This is an important concept, allostatic load, which is the wear and tear in the body and brain that can be a result of conditions such as poverty, racism, chronic hunger, lower socioeconomic status. And it's that cumulative effect that just overwhelms our ability to cope. And that's just one more definition of trauma. That comes from the federal government. I like it, uh, at least, you know, that, that they put in here the lasting adverse effects to the functioning and mental, physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. Uh, and, and so this can have impact in all these different areas. It's important to note that trauma takes different forms, and there are layers. And so one of the barriers to me when I began to learn about trauma-informed care was, well, I work at a level one trauma center. I, I get trauma. 
Um, well, trauma is not just the big T trauma, although it certainly includes that. It's, it's the, the gunshots, the car accidents, the sudden deaths, um, could be an assault, a divorce, uh, loss of a job. But these are single events, typically are more time limited. Then there's complex trauma, and that's kind of what um, we'll talk about in a minute, but what often children are going through when they're exposed to multiple traumas that are invasive, and again, have that long-term impact on the brain and the body. There's trauma that's intergenerational. It happens when the effect of trauma is not resolved in one generation, it gets passed down to the next. Uh, a fantastic um, resource to learn more about this, especially from the context of racism, is uh, Rezma Menachem. Uh, maybe some of you have know his book, My Grandmother's Hands. Uh, and he talks about how um, trauma gets racialized, and it gets racialized uh, different for uh, white bodies than it does black and brown and indigenous bodies. But one thing that he, he really, and Sandra Bloom talks about this a lot as well, is uh, well, white people have to do their own work in terms of their trauma healing. And to recognize, you know, Rezma points out how violent the context we came from in Europe and brought a lot of that stuff. You know, we have all the American mythology, you know, all our relatives came over and happy and, you know, pioneered in America. And well, what made people leave those contexts in Europe? And what did they really face when they got here? And who did they impose their own unresolved trauma on? Well, it's the people who lived here, indigenous people, people then who we enslaved. And um, that this is something I've had to really do some deeper reflection on and, and healing about and has taken me a long time in my life to sort of get there. Uh, there is, um, oh, and intergenerational trauma really began to be noticed back in the, the 50s and 60s when uh, some psychiatrists were working with children of Holocaust survivors. And they were curious that these children who had not grown up in concentration camps, the parents had lived through the Holocaust, were manifesting symptoms of you know, profound post-traumatic stress. Well, well, that term didn't really exist until a little bit later, but they couldn't figure out what was going on. And they began to study how trauma gets passed down. And now we know more about, actually, there can be genetic changes. There's a whole field called epigenetics. Uh, when our uh, chromosomes actually get shifted because of traumatic experience, and that those can get passed down uh, generationally. And then this got expanded to look at uh, the Native American community and then uh, the experience of African Americans and, and, and historical trauma. And that really alludes to um, trauma occurring in history to a specific group of people. Uh, and then that trauma gets passed down generation to generation. And this trauma uh, also gets complicated by the fact that whole systems then get organized around inflicting trauma. And that is certainly what's happened in the United States with 450 years of, of racism that is institutionalized. And then finally, there's trauma that is um, system-induced. And that's really important for us, I think, to understand as, um, uh, as a uh, faith community. So when people come to a place where they expect to feel safe, where they expect to feel uh, they, they're, they're going to um, find healing and connection, and they get re-traumatized in that system. It's because that system's unjust policies, it's harmful practices, it's invasive procedures, racism or cultural bias within that system, that can just be devastating. And we began to learn about this. Actually, a term got uh, invented after the Vietnam War called sanctuary trauma, where um, it, was, it was being noticed that there were veterans uh, seeking care at the VA. These are Vietnam veterans were seeking treatment for PTSD, and they were their PTSD symptoms were being triggered uh, not just by the memories of Vietnam, but actually by the system of care and how bad it was in the VA, because they had here had were coming to expect to be uh, to safe, and the system re-traumatized them. Think about the sexual abuse crisis that faith communities have experienced. People come to the church, expect to be safe, have someone victimize them in that context how profoundly uh, devastating, uh, impactful that can be.
And I can spend a lot of time on this, but uh, there was a big study back in the 1990s. Some of you may have heard of it, Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. It was done in the Kaiser Permanente system in California. It was done pro predominantly on white, middle-class, privately insured patients. It was done in conjunction with the Centers for Disease Control. And these researchers were curious why people, it was actually, it was a weight loss clinic, it was a bariatric clinic, and why so many of the patients were not able to maintain their health and why they were, rever they were doing so well and then would, would relapse. Uh, and they began to sort of look at the, the histories of these patients uh, as children. And they came up with a, uh, a questionnaire uh, with five questions related to um, personal things that happened to you as a child, physical abuse, verbal abuse, sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional neglect. Five were related to things that happened to other family members, parent who's got an addiction issue, uh, witnessing domestic violence, uh, there's incarceration of a parent or family member, family member diagnosed with mental illness, disappearance of a parent through divorce, death, or abandonment. And each of these 10 categories counted as one trauma, so a person who's been physically abused with one alcoholic parent, mother who's beaten up, has an ACE score of three. And I know you had, a few years ago, for the Westminster Forum, you had the, one of the you know, world uh, authorities on this, um, uh, Nadine, Nadine um, uh, Harris-Burke, or is it Burke Harris, I always forget, uh, come and, and, and talk, and she's now the Surgeon General of California. California uh, has, uh, through her office, has now mandated that all pediatricians receive training in how to screen for ACEs, and um, they question and, and they have a way of uh, assessing ACEs. And why is that important? Well, that what they found out is childhood trauma is very common, and so it was really shocking. They thought, "Wow, this is a white middle class educated group, and two thirds of the people had ACEs scores." They found there's a direct link between childhood trauma and adult onset of on disease, uh, depression, suicide. And by disease, I mean um, high blood pressure, diabetes, chronic heart failure, cancer. And they have found these direct connections. Uh, shocking statistic that people who have an ACEs score of six or more have a 20 year less life expectancy than someone with no ACEs. That's a, that's a profound uh, finding. So um, this is why uh, healthcare is now beginning to look at, well, isn't it important that as we, even as we treat adults, we begin to, to recognize the deeper um, story? And uh, at first, some clinicians uh, are wary about, well, I don't know if I want to go into that with my patient. It, what I find talking to my physician friends who do screen for ACEs is it's a profoundly liberating thing for many patients and families when they recognize that um, uh, I, what, what happened to me wasn't my fault, you know, and so that can be very, very freeing. Uh, there's a lot of shame and blame that we inflict on people in healthcare, and uh, ACEs is, is one way of helping people understand uh, that there's that there's a deeper story, and there's there, there's a path uh, there's a path through that through that trauma. And we'll we'll talk about that in a minute. This has been replicated also in urban contexts. Roy Wade from Philadelphia came up with an urban ACEs, looking at things like have you witnessed violence in 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 your neighborhood? Uh, are you feeling unsafe? Have you experienced racism? Do you have experience living in foster care? Have you experienced bullying? This study has been replicated many times around the country, including in Minnesota, and, and the findings typically are very similar. So this is a very uh, basic slide uh, for the non-scientists among us here. Um, this is a, uh, it's kind of what's happening with the brain uh, under uh, conditions of threat, the brain and the body. You know, under normal conditions, you know, you're, you're coming down the road, uh, the brain is able to observe what's happening. You're able to receive input from the environment. It's called um, uh, introception. You are able to interpret the, the, the signals uh, in your environment, uh, those external things that are happening. You're able to process events, evaluate options, plan what to do next, and then to act. And you're operating then out of that prefrontal cortex, you know, the higher functioning of the brain the thinking stuff that a lot of our like healthcare and policies are, are based on. 
Well, what happens when you're coming down the road and there's that proverbial bear right there? Uh, well, our bodies and our brains um, are programmed to survive and to respond to that condition of threat by uh, going on an express route to bypass that threat, uh, going into then the sympathetic um, nervous system where you're reacting, you're, you know, that fight, fight, uh, and freeze mode that we, we know about. And then hopefully by reacting that way, um, you are able to act in a way that will help you survive. And you get through that, you go back to life, and uh, you cope. Well, what happens when the alarm system is going off all the time? And you've got threats all around you. You have a neighborhood that's unsafe. You are experiencing all kinds of uh, micro and ma macro aggressions because you inhabit a black body in a white system. That alarm system is going off all the time because you feel like you are not safe, you're under threat. The, the express route becomes the main road. And this then becomes problematic because you're always on edge. You're always in that reactive mode. You're not able to respond out of your thinking brain you're in survival brain. And this is a, a little thing we teach at the hospital. The thinking brain is the rider on a, and the survival brain is the horse. And things are nice, things you know, ideally are going well when the rider, the thinking brain, and the survival brain are, are acting in tandem with one another. Um, when the, the, the thinking brain goes offline under those conditions of threat and falls off the horse, we've got to find a way to get that rider back on the horse. But people who, are, who have been exposed to constant threat, constant um, attacks on, on their personhood, they're not feeling safe in their bodies at all, um, their rider is going to be chronically off the horse. So when they show up in our healthcare system, um, they're going to be showing up at the top. You know, we see the, the top of this pyramid. We see the behavior problems. We see the physical illnesses. We see people very dysregulated emotionally, acting out a lot. What we don't see, and our system is not good at looking at what's beneath the surface. What's been the trauma and loss that a person, a family, a community has experienced? Uh, why is that body in this the state of chronic hyperarousal, chronic inflammation. And that's some of the mechanism now for the disease process. Uh, when these adverse childhood experiences happy, happen, the body gets activated into that stress response. The stress response becomes like the normal day-to-day -day thing. The body, the body keeps the score. That's a famous book on trauma by Besser uh, van der Kolk. It's in my, my resources here. You'll get the slides if you want them as well. Um, so we have to go a lot deeper. Here are some of the characteristics of individuals who get organized around trauma. This comes from Sandra Bloom. Inability to grieve and anticipate the future, problems with authority, lack of basic safety and trust, loss of emotional management, problems with thinking, problems with communicating, and a confused sense of fair play. And then whole systems get organized around trauma. And I think that that bottom one, uh, everything else is parallel. Look at the bottom one. The system then becomes unjust, and it can't act because it gets stuck in its own trauma response as well. And that's my, uh, that was my experience with Hennepin Healthcare with what happened that night to Philando's family, and not just his family but um, many other occasions where we got stuck in our own trauma response, we began to act unjustly, and then we couldn't act out of what we knew was the right thing to do because you know, we, we couldn't control how we were thinking and feeling, and we got frozen. So I'm just going to skip here to the um, last couple slides because, um, oops, here we go. I want to talk just about some of the, um, the spiritual care dimensions of this. I want to leave a few minutes for questions. Um, so historically, you know, our faith traditions, our religions often uh, would characterize sort of bad behavior as this is coming from a bad person. You know, that person's evil. You know, they're a sinner. They're possessed. 
Um, medicine came along, science came along. Well, let's, let's characterize everybody as sick. This is all just because you have an illness. I think right now where we are, we're probably a combination of sick and bad in our, in our, in our systems of care. The trauma-informed uh, movement asks us to look at things through the framework of injury, of injury. What's happened? So the question moves from what's wrong with you? What's wrong with that family? What's wrong with that coworker? What's wrong with that neighborhood that they're acting this way? Why is all that going on over there all the time? To what's happened? What's, what's the deeper story? Which is a harder question to get at because sometimes we get answers that are really painful to hear. If you think about all these public health problems uh, and we could see them through the framework of trauma, of injury, uh, how might our, our approaches change? This is just one um, definition of a trauma-informed system. Again, it comes from SAMHSA at the federal level realizes the impact of trauma and understands potential paths of recovery, recognizes symptoms of trauma, responds by integrating knowledge about trauma into policies, procedures, and practices, and seeks to actively resist re-traumatization. Think about that as, as a faith community. How might we as, as, as congregations become a trauma-informed place? Um, that's a slide we also use a lot at the hospital. It comes to us from San Francisco Department of Health. But the goal here is moving from being a trauma-organized system or community to one that's trauma-informed with the goal of becoming a healing place, a healing community where we have the ability to be reflective, to make meaning out of the past and not just be stuck in a cycle of, of you know, running away from it where we um, are able to grow and help others grow, where the focus becomes on prevention, um, there's more collaboration, there's equity, right? There's equity in the system, moving away from leadership that's hierarchical, um, and, there, and there's justice. I love this uh, quote, I love, you know, Benjamin Barber, hero of mine from uh, North Carolina, and, and he talks about, you know, the need for us to become repairs of the breach, to, to be biblical, um, and for us, as we imagine this uh, in my context, we say in order to do that, and this is using Benjamin Barber's words, um, um, the, uh, we need to, to move from, um, we need to acknowledge there is a breach. We have to name historical trauma, systemic racism, and implicit bias. These are prerequisites to creating safety. You know, if we're not able to acknowledge that and to, and to name the harm that's been caused, we're not going to be able to, to move and in, in to, in to build real trust or safety. So just in, in closing, a couple, I think, of the unique contributions of spiritual care to trauma-informed care begins with our, our, I think, our unique capacity in the faith community to help cultivate conditions of safety. Um, so fundamental... Um, Characteristic of trauma is people don't feel safe. They've had their sense of safety taken away. Reducing the effects of, of and healing from trauma involves restoring conditions of, in which safety can be experienced at the neurobiological level. So it does begin with our, our bodies. As human beings, but we're wired to connect with one another. Um, we, we use the term to co-regulate one another. That's a, a term that's come out of trauma-informed care. That helps people we care about feel safe. Safety begins with physical safety, but it includes emotional, cultural, social, and spiritual safety. So as we think about this in terms of a, 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 as people of faith, how, how do we do that with one another? How did we do that in our families, and in, in our congregations, in our neighborhoods? Uh, this comes from um, uh, Bonnie Badenock, who writes a lot about trauma-informed care, and I love this quote. We all need groups of support that are dedicated to just being present to one another. Whether it's two people getting together, or two or three are gathered, <laughs> whether it's 10 people getting together, there's a sense in our bodies that we're really just here for one another, that we can hold whatever it is that arises in that moment. We are meant to be interdependent through our entire lives. I, I was out noticing during when I was preparing for this, your art exhibition, you know, the art of belonging. And I was like, wow, we could just, 
show the the uh, the art out there today, uh, that sense of I felt very connected and safe and uh, inspired as I walked around, and I loved you know that whole. Um, I think isn't Westminster's what's your motto to be a telling presence in the city. So I didn't really connect that till I, I saw it on. I was like, oh, embody presence. And, and so how do we do that as as a church? Co-regulation, those grains of wheat in the field, co-regulating one another. <laughs> But for, you know, some people, relationships can trigger threat. You know, they, they don't feel safe with other people. So it, it's up to us who are caregivers to recognize uh, when trauma is at play and uh, to work with people to build those conditions of safety. And to recognize this bottom point here, that attention-seeking behaviors are, in fact, connection-seeking behaviors. We often label and judge people for you know their behaviors and I, I mean I still do it all the time and then recognize well what what was the deeper need that person was trying to get met by acting that way what was their life story what happened to them in the, the you know the, in the, the hour before they walked in here um, and um, rather than, than put a label on it to go deeper And then uh, I think the, the last couple I have here, uh, to be a witness. And De Deborah Hunsinger is a, is a, is a reformed uh, theologian, has written a book on trauma. And she says, Com through compassion, though compassion and witnessing does not remove the pain of trauma, it reconfigures it by restoring human connection, building strength and hope even in the midst of tragedy. I don't have time to go through these qu four quadrants of witness, but there are... There are effective ways to witness and some less effective ways to witness, but it's important that as people come in with their stories and as, as we listen to community in their stories and, and witness to the pain that has occurred, um, it's important we be empowered in awareness about the impact of trauma uh, and uh, we be aware of where people are and um, we don't try to shut them down or try to have all the answers or try to navigate for others where they need to go. And then the final one here is to nurture story. Um, Chad, you'll appreciate, I don't know if you can see this slide, but it's actually a picture I took some years ago at the Abbey of Gethsemane in Kentucky where Thomas Merton had lived. And this is a statue that was placed to commemorate uh, Jonathan Daniels, who was uh, murdered uh, during the Civil Rights Movement. He was an Episcopal seminarian and um, it's a very profound kind of pieta sort of uh, um, statue. But this, this quote from Richard Mollica, when violence leads to physical and mental injury, it also engenders a healing response. One aspect of this is the trauma story, whose function is not only to heal the survivor, but also to teach and guide the listener, and by extension, society in healing and survival. As people of faith, you know, are the story of God's love for the world, you know, creation, fall, redemption. That's all part of who we are as Christians. How do we also narrate the stories of others? Let them come into our midst uh, and share their stories of trauma and, and healing. Uh, and how do we create the space for that to happen? And then finally, uh, to unearth sources of meaning, sources, and strength. Now, I don't go here too fast with people. I, I don't usually get to that in my work as a, as a trauma chaplain because I'm dealing with people in immediate crisis. And you don't go to someone who's grieving an intense loss right away and say, oh, so how are you making meaning out of that? You know, where do you find God here? You know, and like, get out of my room. I'm going to hit you, you know. Um, but people get there. And so there's a, a, a field now called post-traumatic growth. I love this um, quote from John Allen, a physician. To hope is to adopt an existential stance. The grounds for hoping do not lie in the facts of reality, but rather in the meaning we ascribe to reality. Hoping is an active process of meaning make, making meaning. While hope is founded in our capacity to make sense of suffering, we need more than the power of our reasoning to sustain it. We need more than the head. We need the heart. And that's a really profound contribution that we as people of faith can make to trauma healing. All right, I think I'm going to close with that to, in order to a couple of resources.
great book. Anybody who sort of wants to delve in uh, to, from a more theological perspective, this is by Jennifer Baldwin, has a, a newer book about thinking theologically in the, in the uh, era of trauma. And if you want to go really deep, um, Shelley Rambo, who teaches at Boston University, um, has two very powerful theological reflections on trauma. Spirit and Trauma uh, ha is, a, is an extended meditation on um, you know, uh, uh, the experience of Holy Saturday, Jesus in the tomb, where the creed says Jesus descended into hell. What happened on Holy Saturday? You know, there's a total eclipse of God. It's where a lot of people going through trauma feel like there is no hope, there is no way through. And she meditates on this from a theological perspective that uh, we need to develop as Christians a better um, understanding of how to remain with pain and be with others in pain uh, who are in that Holy Saturday moment. And then her newer book uh, talks about um, Easter, but you know the, the risen Christ appeared with wounds, right? He wasn't just totally healed. He appeared with with wounds. With he he was the crucified Christ yet risen. Uh, and she has a reflection on um, people who have experienced uh, war trauma, moral injury, and uh, living with those wounds. And, and, and what do we, as people of faith, do with people who are still with those wounds? So powerful books. I will close it. And I know I've, I want to leave a few minutes. So we get cut off right at 10 after, I'm told. So were there questions coming in, Gretchen? I saw you got a note or not yet. OK. Any questions here? Any questions? Yeah, Lucy. We'll wait for the microphone over here. Great. I really like how you talked about groups and about sharing with each other, and we're working on that really hard at our church. Yeah. How do you do? You have examples of ways that you help the people who keep returning to to Hennepin Healthcare, who are these trauma victims, and then you see their kind of frequent flyer status. Yeah. They come back and back. And I know what you do is great, and I hear from Chad stories that he hears at the bedside. That yeah. I wonder what you do to help people as they leave. Do you have a way of connecting them with the help that they so badly need? Yeah, I know in, in my context, and I was a, the chaplain on the surgical ICU for four years, and so um, especially we worked closely with some of the victim advocates, especially people who have been victims of violence. The, they, they were always really helpful. There's a whole network now of trauma therapists in, in Minnesota. They have a website um, that I found really helpful to make referrals for if people want to do individual processing. What we know is a lot of people actually get through some remarkable events without any kind of formal professional help. Um, there tends to be a class and race issue sometimes in people's access as well to, to resources. So we're also uh, connecting people with um, uh, some, um, there's some great entities in town. Uh, Kente Healing Circle is one of them. We've been able to work with um, for African American folk who, who are wanting to do more trauma healing. So I think that's really, that's an important thing to have connections out there. I still feel at a loss sometimes, like you're just able to just, be there in that moment and say, okay, um, one of the hard things about being a chaplain is just recognizing I can't fix, I can't change what happened. I can be this presence now and, um, and then I know someone's going to leave and, and to surrender that person into God's hands as much as I can and as well, hopefully in the moment, providing resources as, as I can but also recognizing that um, I'm probably going to see them again back in the hospital. And um, that's, that's the reality we're, we're in. So uh, I would say just for those of you who want, so, uh, there's been some fantastic progress being made in terms of trauma healing with different modalities, like uh, EMDR is, really has had profound results. Um, a lot of stuff that we're recognizing is talk therapy doesn't really work that well long term with trauma victims. That there's got to be attention paid to to the body and trauma healing. We don't know how all that works. Like even though EMDR, which is you know works with rapid eye movement or sometimes with your hands, no one really knows 
why this works, and it was kind of a, a fluke when Francis Shapiro discovered this, but it's worked. And so, you're like, well, um, there are a lot of spiritual practices that are, uh, and Reyes Menachem talks about this a lot too, uh, things that uh, ancient cultures knew, that traditional religions knew, things like drumming, rhythmic movements, focus on breathing, communal rituals, you know, things that like psychology and psychology is throughout 100 years ago, like, oh, that's a bunch of religious mumbo jumbo. Um, wow, huh, that, that seems to work for people to metabolize their trauma and to heal. Uh, and we as, as people of faith need to be at that table and say, well, yeah, hello, you know, um, that's, that's who we are and that can be a contribution we can make um, in tandem with, you know, we don't claim as, as chaplains to have answers for psychiatric healing disorders, whatever, but we have a contribution to make and I think churches ought to be uh, very um, conscious of that. As I know Westminster has been very impressed with what, the work you've done here, so... Um, Another, yes. Oh, you've got a question? I've yeah. got a question, too, so I'm going to preempt, uh, but then we'll go there. Um, I know that uh, I work for the Minneapolis Health Department and um, have been intrigued by this, and we were actually working in a collaborative across many organizations yeah. in the metro area, all of us trying to get somewhere, being trauma-informed <laughs> or trauma-responsive. And one of the things that, that um, kind of turned the light bulb on for me is that Many of us in systems, and I think churches too, we, we are gathered together because we believe we are helping. We are good people. We have good intentions. And to realize that with those good intentions, we might have a limited worldview and we might actually be causing harm in the way that we are helping yep. was a huge light bulb for me. Yeah. And so I think I know you talked about the need to do this with community because there is so much about what we are doing yeah. in our goodness yeah. that we can't see the damage no. or the difficulty. And so if you could just talk a little bit about that engaging the community yeah. or how do we hear from some other perspectives that show us what we need to change. Yeah, that's really important. And I know we're gonna lose our online viewers in a few minutes here, but um, yeah, community is key and actually listening to what the, the, the lived experience has been uh, in, in our community, particularly for institutions that are, let's just say, white. Uh, and hospital is a, is a white institution. I mean, it's been run by white people for, but again, and I think to your point, Gretchen, you know, people with good intentions, but then also not recognizing. Uh, I think the first step for, for us has been to listen to the stories of harm and not to run away from those. Uh, and that was hard when Philando's family came and they said, you know, here are all these things we expected from you and here's where you failed. And you know, our first tendency as institutions is, oh, but we did this and we did this and we did this and we, that doesn't matter what we did. This is the harm that was, this is the impact. It wasn't the intention, this was the impact. Uh, so to really listen and then to validate those stories and then to make that amends thing, which also is really hard for systems of care to do, to admit we've actually inflicted harm. So um, we have another question and then a suggestion that maybe if we can look at that, um, the slide that had the, the iceberg on it sure. would be helpful too. I'll let yeah. you find this slide. That's first. right, go for it, yeah. I just wondered, you've hinted at this in some of your responses to previous questions. I just wonder if you could give an example. If a person were to come to you or you visit their room and your job is to provide spiritual care, could you give us a picture of before and after? Like, <laughs> what was your practice like before you became aware of trauma-informed yeah. care? And then what are some of the things you do differently now that you have embraced this model? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I mean, one thing, I'm just so much more aware of uh, when I walk into a room, what that might trigger in the patient or the family, particularly if, uh, well, I mean, it's, it's not if, it's, it's oftentimes when we walk into rooms, uh, I'm in having a white body um, I have a name tag 
identifies me as employee of this healthcare system. Um, I'm Christian. And what's happening then right away to that patient, that family who shares a different experience of being in this world than I've had? Uh, and slowing down enough to monitor that response, what's going on in that patient's body. I was, I'm much more attuned to bodies than I used to be. Um, I mean, I went to Oberlin and Harvard. I mean, it was all in my head, you know? I mean, all in my head. <laughs> so it was like, um, to really go, okay, what's, what's happening to my body? What's my breathing like? Uh, what have I, when, I, when I start to sort of feel jittery, uh, I begin, I, okay, how can I slow things down, modulate my own emotional response to this? especially if, if situations of extreme crisis that I'm encountering. Um, because if I'm going to help create that condition of safety there, begins with me, um, uh, Reisman talks about this as having a settled body. Does it mean I come in with the answers or I'm you know, totally grounded or I'm, uh, and then also what's happening uh, after that visit, you know, that I'm able to kind of discharge the energy of that because recognizing that's gonna have had, had an impact on me and on, and. I used to just walk from room to room to room and do this all day and go, okay. But I was taking energy from one room and taking it into the next and the next. And then what do you think I did when I went home? You know, like I just wanted to like totally numb out and not do with my wife or my kids. And that's changed a lot as well since I've discovered trauma-informed care. Part of me is really regretful it took me this long because uh, I think, oh man, I could have inflicted a lot less harm and um, but that's that's been the journey that, that I've been on. So thank you for that question. It's a great question. Yeah. Uh, just in sort of closing up, uh, David, thank you so much. And I was going to ask for the icebreaker again because our theme this year is diving deeper. So I'll okay. flourish. So as Gretchen was inviting <laughs> us to think about our world this year, it's mostly a chamber of love that our blue line is more of the Holy Spirit is giving us the courage to go deeper into these waters. So thank you. Amen. Oh. Thank you for, for bringing our theme back to our, our minds and our hearts and, and an illustration to go with that. So thank you so much, David. Um, a big job to ask you to come and, and bring us into this, this understanding of trauma, and, and you did it so well, and, and I thank you for that. Um, next week, um, we are going to have two representatives from the Advocates for Human Rights and they're going to join us on a discussion of immigration detention. And there's going to be a, uh, a, a short film that we're going to see that the, I think the Presbyterian Church has put together, and then we'll have a chance to talk with them about um, what is going on and, and uh, deepen our understanding and our, hopefully our sense of what we can do as well. So thank you all.